Good evening. Hello. Hi, we are live now. Mary? Thank you for joining us. We're happy to, happy to see all of you guys back. We are excited for tonight. We're going to explore financial education strategies. Uh, that is our topic tonight, best practices in financial education. Next slide, please. So for tonight, obviously we're using Zoom. We want to make sure that you have everything set correctly. This Zoom uh, webinar is best viewed on a laptop or a computer. A smaller device than that will be, make things more difficult to see into totality. If you need voice interpretation, make sure you have the uh, audio turned on so you can hear the voice interpreters through the whole presentation. Also, if you need closed captioning, click the button at the bottom that says closed captioning, and you can actually move that closed captioning screen anywhere you want that's best for you on your monitor. If you have any issues where you can't see or can't hear or can't see the captioning, please use the chat feature. We have tech support ready to answer any issues that you may have. Next slide. How to use Zoom. Make sure that you're using the most recent version, the updated version of Zoom. I know that there's constantly updates, so just check and make sure that all of your features are ready and available and updated. Click and make it a full screen view and you should see a beautiful video of Todd and myself and you'll see two lines in the middle that you can click and scroll left or right to either make our videos bigger or the PowerPoint bigger. You can adjust the size of both to your comfort. We We'll have a time for questions. Please type your questions in in the Q&A box and later towards the end, we'll cover those. If you have any comments or technical issues, put those in the chat box, not in the Q&A, just to keep those two entities separate. If you have a question that someone else has already asked, click the upvote button and the more people that upvote a question, we'll make sure it's top priority while we're answering questions. Of course, this would not be possible without CSD Learn's partnership with funding from Wells Fargo. We want to thank you for making this all possible to bring all of this to you, our audience. And next slide. Yes, I guess we do have to do our introductions again, Todd. <laughs> My name is Mary Ellen Graham, and I am living here in Austin, Texas. I work at the Texas School for the Deaf as a statewide outreach center. Uh, specialist. I work all throughout the whole state of Texas. It's been an awesome experience, which led me to know that we need more things like this. So I was really happy to join the team with CSD to provide this webinar with Todd. Take it away, Todd. Yes. Hi, good evening. I'm Todd Bonello, and I'm here in Frederick, Maryland. I currently work at Gallaudet University. I teach in various areas. I teach math and information technology, and I also teach gen eds. And uh, I cover personal finance and math, and I have a course specific to personal finance. And so I'm thrilled to be here at our second webinar of a series of six. And next slide, please. The goals for today's webinar are four. We want to compare the differences between teaching in the classroom and now with the shift teaching remotely and any differences that may lie between both. Also, we want to identify how to use technology and technological tools to improve um, teaching. And typically in the classroom, we have hands on activities. And now that those are lacking, what's in place to replace them? So what we can uh, use to make up for those lacking experiences. Also, we wanna find ways to assess student comprehension levels while teaching remotely. So keep in mind, those are the four goals for tonight. And as Mary, Ellen and I are not specialists in personal finance. However, I do know that there are other people that most likely excel in, in that field. So we have brought in a special guest to join us tonight. And the next slide shows who that is. Our special guest is Daniel Hines. Daniel is out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Daniel, please join us on the screen. 
Hello. Hi, Daniel. We are so thrilled to have you here with us tonight. And I'll uh, have you introduce yourself, tell us a bit about yourself, a little bit of background, if you don't mind, Daniel. Thank you. Hello, I was born and raised in Miami, Florida, and I currently live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I work at the New Mexico School for the Deaf. I'm a math teacher. I also teach personal finance. Now, the state of New Mexico considers personal finance as a math class. So I've been teaching personal finance class and I'm really happy to join this here tonight. Thank you for joining you. us, says Mary Ellen. Yes, and again, we're excited to have you here tonight, Daniel. So we're gonna start off tonight by polling the audience. Next slide, please. Mary Ellen, why don't you tell us about the poll and we'll go ahead and have a discussion about it. Sure, this is something I'm really curious to know from the audience. Let's show the poll question, please. All right, there we go. Okay, Currently, we are you working remote or face-to-face, -face, in-person, or a hybrid, a combination of the both? Knowing some schools, have teachers working in classrooms um, and both in and out of the classroom. So tell us what your situation is currently. What's your experience? And while we wait for all of those answers to come in, Daniel, what are you doing now at NMSD, the New Mexico School for the Deaf? At NMSD, our school has been closed. We don't have any students that are able to come on campus. So we are fully online still. And that may go, actually, we don't know when that will end. Todd? And this is Todd speaking right at Gallaudet. We started back in March with a similar um, a program where we went 100% remote learning. And now for the first semester of the school year, we have remained with the same. And for the second semester, it has already been announced that we're going to continue completely remote and be online learning, which means that this could continue possibly into the following fall or summer. Who knows how long this could be, as long as we're dealing with the pandemic. Uh, Mary Ellen, are you still at home? How are you doing in your work? Well, at the Texas School for the Deaf, they have a hybrid situation. Some students are on campus, some are remote, but I work in outreach, so I see different schools throughout the state of Texas. Some are completely closed and fully remote. Some have a mixture, and some are fully back face-to-face -face in person. So there really is a true mixture there. Okay, well, I think the results are in, so let's show that on the screen now for everyone to see. Mary Ellen, wow, we have 67% working remote, 19% in person, face to face, and 14% of a hybrid combination of both. Wow, it seems like most people are working remote. Yeah, this is fascinating, really, that throughout the country and all areas, all sorts of things are going on. Some states are more focused on the online programs. Some are having the hybrid program and some are completely face-to-face -face again. I do feel that this webinar tonight will benefit everyone across the board, whether you are in a face-to-face -face physical space or online. Daniel has a lot of tips and suggestions, right? That we'll cover tonight. And let's get moving then. There is a fact that I'd like to share and have everyone ponder, and it's on the next slide. Oh, yeah. Perhaps we may not have realized, but at least 93% of children in the United States of America are currently participating in learning via distance learning. Now, again, some students and children are in hybrid programs, but at least 93% are learning remotely. So we see that's a huge number participating in that distance learning. So keep that 93% in mind as I ask Danielle my next question. One more slide. Daniel, I'm curious with your experience you teach personal finance and you've taught that for a while and you've taught that 
in a face-to-face -face setting, physical setting, I think for now seven years, right? How many years have you been teaching? Well, I taught math specifically for the past seven years, but I started teaching personal finance over the last four years. The last four years, personal finance. Okay. Now that things have transitioned remotely and people are online, I know that there are pros. There are also cons to it. Can you tell us about your experience with both the pros and the cons? Okay. Well, last year I was teaching personal finance as one of my classes. And as I was teaching, COVID became more serious, as we all know, and we transitioned to uh, teaching online in March. It was coming up on the fourth quarter in school. And yeah, it was quite a shift because the experience that we're used to is, you know, taking students on field trips, explaining things in person, modeling, showing examples. Many students are able to show their knowledge through projects that they make, posters, various different hands-on activities in the classroom. So shifting online, meant everything had to go digital. So yes, I did uh, have a positive experience in class and we made it a positive experience online by giving students more one-on-one -on -one focus, really. And then my biggest challenge is that some students who live out in more remote areas of New Mexico, um, so understand this is the state of New Mexico. So we have a lot of native and indigenous students Native American and indigenous students um, in our student population. And some of them live in areas that don't have any internet or any signal. So they have no access to education. So we tried to figure out how we could fix and you know face that challenge to provide education for them. Often they come from homes where there's no uh, sign language in the home. If they haven't had any exposure to sign language either at home, that was another barrier and another challenge. We also, um, you know, we were faced with many challenges transitioning online, but uh, we took on those challenges. And also, uh, often I would connect with students and we would do online field trips, you know, so that was my experience. There are a lot of, you know, positives that come from teaching online in terms of student attention, but there are the negatives as well that I just explained. And this is Todd speaking. A follow-up question, as far as your students' performance in class uh, versus a uh, face-to-face -face class, do you notice any difference between the two in the performance, student performance? I mean, let, let's say in the classroom, it was a very moti motivated, highly motivated student. Has that changed in that transition to online or distance? In general, I'd say that student behaviors stay the same, whether they're face-to-face -face or virtual. It, students who have high academic ethics or who are high achievers submit their work on time, when they shifted online, they kept those same ethics. Other students that need more reminders uh, actually had more of a challenge online because in person, the student, the teacher could be there in person, you know, reminding them and to, whereas when the student's at home, they'd have to rely on a parent or another caregiver to make sure that they're staying on task. But I would say that behaviors stay, stayed mostly the same. Uh, whether they're in person or online. So if they're progressing a certain way in the classroom, they progress the same way online. That's a good question though. I would have to agree with you on that, Daniel. And something else I've noticed with this shift online is I have been forced to rely on more tech, more gadgets, more tools, more platforms. And I do see the way it benefits the students as well. Like for example, now when I present online, I will do a pre-recorded video and I will pre-record my lecture. And now I have content that students love because they can watch it again and again when they have to. It's not a one-time thing like it is in the physical classroom where if they miss the lecture, it's gone. Uh, they have to reach out to the instructor for any follow-up. But in terms of having a video, it can just be rewound and watched again. So that is another pro and there are plenty. 
This is Mary Ellen. I'm wondering for your classes, do you require all of your students' videos to be turned on or can they decide whether they have their video on or off while you're, you know, lecturing or giving an explanation? And what's your preference? This is Daniel. Right. In my classroom, I leave it up to the students and most of my students do leave their videos off. Some do prefer to have their video on and that's fine as well. But as I go along teaching, if I pose a question, let's say during the middle of class, I do that to see who's really attending. So I'll ask a question and as everyone pops their screens up, I see they're ready to answer. And if someone still has their video off, then I'll check in and see what's going on over there. Right. So I'll do that during my lecture to be aware of who's not paying attention. I don't require everyone to keep their video on. And this is Todd. I know some K through 12 schools have a policy that the students can't be required to have their video screen open. It's optional. In Gallaudet, I know some professors approach that in the same way. It's not required, but it is very encouraged here for our students to have their video on. And of course, we are aware that some students live with situations where they're uncomfortable displaying the background that they're sitting in. And for those reasons, uh, we are very uh, compassionate and understanding and they can have their video screen closed. But <clears throat> we're still looking for that person of person feeling. And with all the videos screens off, kind of lose that feeling of being in an audience and it's easy to be distracted. So maybe things might just be a little different with K through 12. That's really neat yeah. to mention that. This is Daniel. It's also important to be mindful of students that may have a lot of things going on in their background that could be a distraction to others. For example, we have some students who have siblings in the house with them. And so it's a very busy environment that they're in. Sometimes there's noise in the background or music playing. So because of those things, you know, we have to be respectful of some families as well. Because, so true. you know, we won't, don't want to interject too much. Um, they have their own family lives that are going on at the same time. So we have to be mindful of what their family situation looks like, their backgrounds. Maybe the student doesn't feel comfortable showing their background. They can be creative and set up some kind of scene or a visual background for themselves, you know, or a black background to mask the, the background that they're in, you know, and some students do feel that. It makes them feel more comfortable. Mary Ellen, this is Mar that you're flexible. Yeah, let's go ahead. So, of course, we do love our polls. We have to admit that. Let's see the next one. All right. Which video platform do you currently use to teach your students? Are you using Google Meet, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, or something else? We're curious. So please go ahead and answer so we can see the most popular platforms. For myself, I use Zoom typically every day. I feel like I'm on Zoom every day for various meetings and consults with people. What about you? Daniel, I use Zoom for Zoom. class every day. Yes, I do. And Interesting. Some people sign it, sign it this way because you see the different screens lined up on your monitor. They sign yeah, it we both screen. think it's a good sign. Both Mary and Todd, we both believe it's a good sign. Okay, Daniel. Yeah. And this is Todd. I myself also use Zoom. At Gallaudet, we rely on Zoom as well. But I'm really curious if anyone here has any experience with Google Meet, Microsoft Teams, does anyone feel they are value or do they have their drawbacks? This is Daniel. Okay, uh, I'd be willing to explain my different experiences with them. I have used Google Meet video platform as well as Microsoft Teams. And currently I prefer Zoom over those two because Google Same here, Meet, says Mary. Yeah, as deaf people, it's important to know, um, you know, be aware of what deaf people need. And Google Meet, they have one large video and all the rest of the videos are smaller on the side. And in order to get the video to be highlighted and make made large, you have to make an audio sound. Many people don't feel comfortable using their voice, deaf people. And uh, so that's not a very beneficial feature. Same concept with 
uh, Microsoft Teams. Everyone's video is very small, whereas with Zoom, you can adjust the size of each person's video as you prefer. Like right now, I can see the PowerPoint, and at the same time, I can see everyone's video uh, according to the size that I prefer. With Zoom, a lot of people think you have to pay to use it, but I want you to know you no longer have to pay. Uh, it used to be that a basic plan, you would have to pay, uh, you right, only got 40, 40 minutes or 40 minutes free, right? And then beyond that, you'd have to have a paid account. Now, any kind of educational uh, email address, if you have an education account, they will allow you to have a free Zoom with up to 100 participants. This is Todd. I know that Google Meet has its pros and the fact that it's coming directly from your Gmail account. And some schools use Gmail uh, for their school systems. And so they're very integrated that way with Google. But uh, Zoom also has features where you can include the Google Calendar in within Zoom. So it's nice to be able to include that. And then Microsoft Teams, I've had a bit of experience with that platform. And one of the pros to that platform is if it's a, let's say a user group, like let's say a group of teachers that want to get together for brainstorming sessions or a planning session. <clears throat> so they can be in a chat, but when they want to take that chat into a video conference, they can just click a button and go right from there. They don't have to set up a separate meeting. So they can go right from the chat to a video session, which is pretty interesting. And so like Daniel mentioned though, for the deaf experience, the visual experience, that aesthetic, I would say best comes from Zoom. Zoom does offer the spotlight features, the pin feature, the gallery view, the speaker view. So one has a lot of options as to how to participate in a meeting. One can also share. I can have the remote. Uh, I do have the remote ability uh, where I can come in and control a student's computer remotely and work with that. And oh, did we check the results? Well, before we do, I want to add just one point that came to mind. If you have a large number of students in your classroom and you want to assign students to work in groups, you can set up breakout rooms uh, with Zoom. Exactly. You have the potential for big breakout rooms. So each you know, group can work together in their own separate room, which is really nice. Very agreed with the breakout room feature, Daniel. Um, are we ready to see the results from our poll? Mary Ellen, yes, I'm very curious. Let's show the results. <laughs> wow, 91% use Zoom. That is by and far in the lead. 9% using Google Meet and Microsoft Teams, 13% and then others. So 13% is others as well. Uh, what are some others that we haven't mentioned? Maybe Skype, FaceTime. Yes. Uh, even face-to-face, -face, maybe not using any video conferencing platform. Face-to-face -to -face mm. meeting is possible as well. Right. Yeah, I'm fascinated with those numbers, but I did expect them, I have to admit. Let's move on to question number two. So uh, can you please... Let us know what are the different ways that you use technology to help you teach. I know we've just discussed platforms, but are there any other things that we're maybe uh, not aware of? Some other ways that we can use things that we already have where we may think, oh, wow, I have that. I never even thought of using it that way. Do you have any tips? Daniel, yes, there is a lot of technology that we use. Uh, so we've already discussed the use of Zoom, but sometimes if I want to show in personal finance, there's a lot of math concepts, of course, and so I tried to figure out how to show math concepts. That doesn't really work typed out in text. You'd really prefer to use, you know, some type of writing on a board or a paper and pencil. So what I do is use this, this iPad with an Apple pen. And some of you may have a tablet or something that you can use with some type of stylus or pen that connects to the computer. So what I do is open up Zoom. I open up the app and join as another participant. So I'll have a second screen and it will say iPad. 
And then I'll share that screen. And I will then show my iPad on that screen and I'll choose annotation. And that's where I'm able to write on my iPad and it shows up on the screen so the students can see what I'm writing. It's a really cool feature. So that's one. And also I use Google Classroom. Um, that's where I post all of my assignments and different resources, classroom resources, lists, and lectures. I also use Zoom as we talked about uh, for class. Also, sometimes if you want to show a student, say, a field trip or other things, I'll use my iPhone uh, because, you know, you can't. If I don't want to sit and just explain something that's outside of where I am, I'll go somewhere and use my iPhone. Some students also live in remote areas with no internet connection. Some students have no Comcast or internet service provider, no cable, no DSL or anything. And for those students, we will provide a hotspot. It's like a cell phone that can connect you know, cellularly uh, to their device. So often we'll use a hotspot. Our school was very nice to support students in that way so that they can have access. That is extremely nice. Also some students who hotspots don't work for, um, they may not even have cell phone signal in their area. It's so remote, which we do have some students that have an experience like that. Typically we'll send a USB to those students. And that requires us to print and send our assignments to our school secretary. And then they will, uh, they can use sign or videos where they can sign in sign language what their uh, assignments are. Um, so we don't allow recording in class, but what we'll do is have a camera or recording set up without the students featured in the recording. You can use screen, screencast or you can use Loom. And those are uh, platforms where you can show your screen and also sign a video next to it. And then we'll save that video and information to the USB drive because most students will have a Surface laptop, which means that it comes with a pen or a stylus and so they're ready to use that. We'll send them the USB. And our school has a department that's responsible for driving and dropping off these resources to our students. So they can plug in the USB, watch the lesson for the week, uh, submit their work, um, and then those people who are responsible bring that back. And that's the process we do on a weekly basis. Sometimes transportation won't work, and so we can use a mail service and send it by mail. I am a primary contact teacher, so I'm responsible for gathering all of the work and sending it by mail. We also use a variety of web resources, web-based resources for reading or learning, that is. For example, we use uh, a website on how to you know save money go grocery shopping home improvement there's a lot of websites that we use in class to look at how much things cost and so forth and that website's called salary.com one thing uh, that i like using in my learning regarding or teaching regarding budgeting is called budget challenge and it's a website where students will have two months of a fully immersive budgeting challenge where they pay bills, write checks, and it's completely immersive in that way. Um, it's also reinforced. There's bills that they have to pay that pop up and then they have to write a check. So it feels like a real world, real life experience that they're immersed in for two full months. I also have some students that uh, may have some issues with Zoom. Uh, like for example, some schools may have an issue with their class schedules and there's two students in different levels that are put in the same class. And there's discussions on how it's not beneficial for some students um, to be put together 
in a different mm -hmm. class. And so what they use in situations like that is Flipgrid. So that's where questions can be asked, other questions can be answered, other students can send uh, or attach comments to each other's videos and it's really easy to use, it's free. You uh, can have it set up on your Canvas or Google Classroom, various different LMS programs. It's really neat. It can be integrated very easily. So those are some of the tools that I've used as tra wow. we transition online. This is Todd. Wow, you have a long, fascinating list. And <clears throat> I'm real curious, you mentioned about writing with your iPad and your stylus. And uh, that's something I do too, kind of in a similar way, but also slightly different. I will open up a Microsoft Word document on my iPad. The reason I do Word is that um, I take screenshots of my questions and then I go ahead and use them and I put it on the one drive. I just save it once. So I open it on my iPad and then when I start, my list of questions is ready. And then I can go ahead and write on them, on those screenshots that I took. I can write on them. I can have a discussion with the students. And then I save it and it becomes notes that I have ready in one document. And it's a similar technique you use. I think we're pretty close in that. Mary Ellen, I see you wanting to make a comment as well. Mary Ellen here. Yeah, my wheels are just spinning because I was a classroom teacher before I worked in outreach. And I really like that idea because if a student uploads their notes, let's say I used to teach history, I could see and write my notes on their notes directly. So I could write and correspond directly back to that student so they could make the fix and the edit right there. That was really nice. There's no more excuses like I lost my paper. I'm sorry. I'll say, nope, it was right here. I can see it. <laughs> so that was one huge advantage. Uh, I know you mentioned two things and I wanted to ask, you mentioned budgeting challenge last two months. Can that be extended or is it a maximum of two months? This is Daniel. Yes, they only allowed two months max uh, because it's a program that sends you to or emails throughout that two month time span, but it is a really nice program. Mary Ellen, uh, will they charge you a late fee? Let's say, you know, if your bill is due on the 5th and you don't pay until the 7th, just like in the real world, Daniel's saying, yes, they will. When you start budgeting challenge, they actually will throw various different things uh, out. They'll say, you know, you have a car loan. So which program do you want to use? And you have choices. If you're looking for an apartment, which apartment do you want? What kind of lease plan would you like? Or even retirement. Do you want to save for retirement? Emergency fund. They have all of that, all the, of those various options, even your cell phone bill. There's a variety of cell phone bills you can choose from. So when you set that up at the beginning, some students would ask me, you know, what should I pick? And I say, just test it out, go ahead and experiment with it. And they look at me kind of like unsure. And I said, don't worry, just, you know, start working with it. And sometimes they would start spending and realize, oh, I have a hundred dollars left in the bank. And then sometime during that challenge, they would be sent, you know, an emergency. Oop, there's an emergency that's come up. Uh, someone just broke into your home and stole your laptop. What do you do? How do you replace your laptop? Some students can go ahead and choose an insurance plan, a pro personal or property insurance plan so that they don't lose money. And that, that would smart. cover. Yeah. Other students would say, I don't want to pay for an insurance plan. You know, I want to use my money for other things. And then they lose they end up, <laughs> that's it. They lose their money because they didn't buy the insurance plan. And that's a real life lesson, how important insurance can be. If you have your budget in place, you don't, you have to think about the risks as well that you don't plan for. That's a real life experience. That's why I really like this program. This is Todd. I think that's awesome, Daniel. Uh, we'll mention at the end, the resources that we have. Daniel does have a list to share at the end. So folks in the audience, I know you're looking to take notes. No worries. We do have a slide at the end that in includes the budget challenge program as well. So no worries. You will be receiving that information later. 
I think we do have to move forward though to our next question. Question three. And Daniel, I know that folks in the audience are also curious. Um, we know that um, lesson plans are delivered in the classroom. There's projects and things that can be done in the classroom. But now that we're online, personal finance, when it comes to personal finance, how do you teach? What does your lesson plan look like? How do you deliver that? Can you expand on that for us? Well, for me, lesson plans help me schedule what I need to teach. You know, and that way I can just dive in. When I'm teaching, I really let my students guide me. But a lesson plan is more for my scheduling of uh, what I want to teach and making sure I have enough time to teach certain concepts. And I use those lesson plans throughout the year in that way. But teaching finance remotely, actually, you know, let's back all the way up to when teaching, it's important that you envision what your students look like. You have to imagine your students and be mm -hmm. mindful of the students' experiences and backgrounds. Sometimes we'll come up with a concept and explain it all at once. And that's not always beneficial. It's a good idea to break things down. Let me give you one example. If I wanted to teach a lesson on cooking and measurements and uh, personal finance, how much it costs to buy the various items for a particular recipe, or if I want to do a home improvement project, you have to figure out how much that's going to cost for the various items. I have to teach price per unit or price per, you know, gallon of paint. And then you have to figure out the area of the room. There's so many different parts to it. Same thing with grocery shopping. You have to figure out the weight and price per unit or price per weight. Uh, and also tip and tax and all of that goes into it. You can't consolidate that into one chunk, you know, and you also want to make a connection. A real life connection. Many students come from backgrounds where their families, like I explained, don't sign in their home. And so they, the students have no access to language in their home. Typically they'll see their, their parents, um, you know, do the shopping and where children are hearing, they have that incidental learning. They can hear what their parents are talking about. No one explicitly explains what they're doing as they're shopping or budgeting. And so for deaf students, they're missing out on that incidental learning. So I have to teach all of that. I'm responsible to squeeze all of that knowledge in in let's say one year that I have with my students. So let me give you an example. If I was to talk about a cow, many people know that cows are pretty big, right? Some students may see the word cow and they may have seen a picture of a cow and they're, oh, they're thinking, okay, I understand what that is. Other teachers may say, let's go on a field trip to a farm and show them what an actual cow is. And in those situations, a student may, you know, be completely amazed and shocked that that's what a cow is because believe it or not, oftentimes they've only seen a picture and they don't realize that what the real life thing looks like. Yeah, pictures you know? not enough. Right, pictures are not concrete enough. They They're haven't abstract. seen the real thing. Yes, so that's what I'm talking about. You have to go all the way back to those concrete pieces that some students don't have access or experience with. You have to explain what it looks like, connect it to the picture, and then you can explain the abstract once they've grasped the concrete. So when I'm planning a lesson, I have to think about what my students, um, what their experiences are like. Some are language deprived, some are behind educationally, some are on par or even advanced uh, with their grade level. And so there's a wide variety. And what I find is most beneficial is home, uh, or I'm sorry, going on field trips. I'll take my students to Home Depot and uh, I'll show them you know, at Home Depot, if we want to lay out a tile floor, let's say, I'll show them what it looks like to go to Home Depot and purchase the tiles individually or in a So they make the connection. Yeah. Right. Or if you want to paint something, we'll go to the store and show how much it costs per gallon of paint or five gallon of paint. So that way they get those concrete connections. 
and they realize, you know, what it all entails. Same thing going to a grocery store. You show a piece of fruit and then it has the unit price or the price per pound and how do they find that out? So basically, we'll set up a subject that I'm going to teach and then we'll go on a field trip to really dive in deep on that particular topic. And so when I'm deciding topics to teach, I'll think about field trips. But then with COVID happening, that means I'm not working with my students face to face. And that doesn't necessarily mean we can no longer go on field trips. But what we'll do instead, sometimes there's a particular lesson that I'll want to show my students Home Depot for. And instead of bringing them with me, I will go to Home Depot and use NMSD's Zoom account on my iPhone. I'll log on to Zoom with my classroom and I'll say, hey class, guess where I am? I'm here at Home Depot and I'll show them through my phone uh, everything at Home Depot. So, you know, my students uh, are familiar with me and, you know, the size of my hands, let's say. So I'll use that to give them perspective of the size of what I'm showing them. They can gauge the, the size of what I'm showing them uh, by putting my hand, say, next to them. And they'll say, oh, you know, turn left. I want to see what's down that aisle. And so I actually kind of become their tour guide in the store. I'm walking right. around. They're directing me. And I explain how to figure out the price of things. And I'll, you know, use that opportunity to explain whatever questions they have, I'll answer. Same thing with grocery stores. I'll do the same thing. I'll explain, you know, how do you know uh, where, how you're getting a better deal at the grocery store? A lot of students don't realize that, let's say you have a large can of tuna next to a small can of tuna. Most people would think that, uh, most people don't realize that or they would assume that the larger amount would have a smaller unit price that you save more money the more you buy. But with tuna, it's in fact the opposite. There's some small cans of tuna that are more expensive. So I'll show them that and I'll ask, which would you prefer to buy? And they, you know, and we explain unit price despite the, the total price. And so that's the type of experience, the life experience that I'm trying to offer them. And of course you have to wear a mask when you're going to these different places, safety is key as well. But any way you can find to connect with personal experience for these students is just amazing. And for those students, as I said, that don't have internet access, we'll send them the, their assignments. Sometimes if there's a video of a field trip that I've made, um, I will film myself sometimes and explain all of that. And I'll save it to the USB so that the students can get an idea of what we've done if we have no prop. So overall, the overarching goal here is just to think of your students' needs. I have a variety of different resources as I teach as well. I like this book, it's an old one, but it's really good. And this is Mary Ellen, I remember that book. Yeah, Consumer Mathematics. Maybe some of you uh, may want to use this, but there are different topics in this book all broken down. And uh, I'll give you an example of some of them. Grocery shopping, buying a house, personal finance, shopping for a car, uh, travel. And remember for nice. travel, uh, we talk about the heart cruise, the deaf ecosystems and business. We talk about heart cruising, heart cruise line. Just there's so many pieces uh, that you can explain and break down. And then when you get to budgeting, Budgeting is so important for students to learn because, you know, I so often have students that will come up to me and say, I, when I grow up, I'm going to buy a huge mansion or I'm going to have, you know, a fancy car. And I say, okay, well, what's your dream car and how much does it cost? I want you to write that down. And your dream job or career, um, go on to salary.com and see if you can purchase that. And on salary.com, you can type in, you know, you can find Yikes. your salary and what your monthly payment for your car would be. Some people say, oh, I want to go to Tuscany or Brazil or this Brazilian restaurant where, uh, you know, they bring meat, like unending meat to your table. And I say, go ahead, dream on, dream on. All right. 
uh, let's just look at the facts and you know figure out what those actual numbers are. And as they do that, their eyes almost pop out of their head. <laughs> and so I say, so what do you think about this? Well, I guess I'm gonna have to give up on some things, you know, but it helps them realize the reality of things. And then tax, sometimes they learn about tax and they go, why do taxes have to be taken out? And that's a whole other lesson, you know, getting into taxes. But there's so many resources available online that you can use and you can use those resources instead of going on a field trip. You don't have to go to, you know, travel agency or go on specific field trips. You can go on these websites. For example, if their dream car is a Ford, go on to Ford.com and they have a payment calculator that you can type in, you know, and figure that out. Salary.com, you can figure out the salary of your dream job. You can go to Trulia.com and find out the price of a home or even rent. They have a renting component as well. You can go to Nerd Wallet and see how much you know insurance costs and all of these incidentals that add up if a student doesn't have internet access at their home we can print off these different resources how much a car payment would cost and i can give you three different choices here make a spreadsheet too right and then they can lay those out and make a you know a comparison between those those three so these are just some ideas on how we teach personal finance So for the sake of time, we need to continue on. Uh, Mary saying the next question is, can you share some ideas or ways that we can transition from in-person assessment uh, methodologies to online? How can we still get, you know, that very important information? Um, you know, sometimes, our students don't understand what we're discussing. We can check in and say, do you all understand what I'm saying? And they can nod their heads, but there's, and then we do an assessment and we realize, no, they don't actually understand. Having in-class assessments that are maybe paper and pen based, or sometimes I'll assign uh, activities where they have to do a poster. That's great, but how do you do a poster online? Uh, some, you know, don't have paper and pen to work with. And some students, may be sick and they're, uh, we don't want, you know, just for cleanliness and safety, we don't want them to mm -hmm. turn in any kind of paperwork. So uh, Edulastic is an automatic grading assessment program that can give students assessments and at Edulastic, you can put in a PDF of a worksheet. So you have a worksheet and you can scan it, post it, and then there you can add a uh, fill in the blank uh, questions that they can type in the answers to themselves. I use that, I use multiple choice. Some of my uh, tests will have, uh, you know, different, different components and Edulastic has a really great feature or great features for that. Also Google Classroom, uh, we'll use a Word document and type up different questions and then make a copy for each student where the student can then type in their answers. And that's really nice. Then you can see that happening in real time. You know, so I can check in with students mm -hmm. who maybe opened it but haven't completed it, just like I can in the classroom. I can walk by a student's desk and see if they're struggling somewhere and offer some support. With this, I can see what they're doing and how they're progressing in real time. Also, when it comes to making a poster, we use Google Slides, which you can oh, make nice. slides look like a poster, right? And use Google Draw as well, where students can add text boxes just like they would on a poster and write text where they want to. 
type it on the slides. They have different information and different words. They can make larger or smaller. That's probably also a lot cleaner than a life-size paperboard, huh? <laughs> yeah, and it's natural, you know. Yeah, it's related to writing, but it's typing. And then pictures. It's a fun activity, yeah. Some people will mail in papers. Uh, some of them who can't get online, they'll submit paperwork and I'll correct it and send it back. Daniel, I'm amazed. I'm sure you have a whole list more of tips and advice. And again, I emphasize those resources Daniel will be sharing with us, CSD will be sharing with the audience tonight. Everything that Daniel has mentioned tonight, we will make a list of. Don't feel like you're missing out. Don't feel like you have to take notes. Don't feel like after tonight, all that information will be lost. That is not the case. We will follow up with an email containing Daniel's resources. And again, what I just mentioned is now showing on the slide. Daniel, do you want to elaborate a little bit about these books we have on the slide? Yes, I would like to talk about infographic personal finance. This is really neat because there are five different chapters related to different personal finance uh, subjects. For example, liquid assets. Many people don't understand or students understand. They don't understand what that is and they struggle with the concept. They have pictures here that really clarify um, and make a lot of sense. Let me show you. They have some really nice infographics and pictures here that break it down. So it becomes much more visual. Yeah, it's visual. That's why it's called infographic. It's an infographic way because deaf students, of course, love visual information. Uh, it yes, talks about concepts. car buying. Yeah, what you need to purchase a car. And there's uh, pictures. Oh, oh, that's nice. And this is Mary, and it seems more like a checklist as well. <laughs> yeah, gas, tires, and then going to college, budgeting, uh, just so many things. Yeah, more budgeting, spending, debt, credit cards, investments, housing. It's really nice and it expands on the information in a very visual way. It's really neat. And this is Todd. Again, folks that are watching tonight, this information will be available. We have on the next slide a couple of websites that Daniel has mentioned already as well. And again, like I said, we've reviewed these already uh, to figure out how much people earn, the prices of houses. That can be done on those websites. And then is this your favorite one you mentioned, yeah. Daniel, one of your favorites? This is one of my favorite resources for sure. Nice, nice. Next slide. Do you want to talk a bit more about that? I know we covered it already, uh, but you can have those personal finance lessons included via a field trip, as Daniel mentioned, by going shopping with the video camera. And Daniel, again, that's really smart to keep that sensation of being out and about with your class and not having to be in the classroom, in the physical classroom or in the Zoom room all day long. And it just changes the feel of it by taking them on that virtual field trip. And I know that we've answered some of, you've answered some of our questions, Daniel, and the audience surely has their own questions. And so let's go ahead and open up our Q&A session now. This is Mary Ellen. This has statistics. I know you really like and appreciate this one. Right. It's kind of like, did you know? There is a question there. Remember, I asked everyone, did you know 93% students are experiencing or involved in distance learning? Which means it's pretty much throughout our country. Now, that wasn't a number specific for deaf students, hard of hearing students, or hearing students. It's just a generic number. We know that students that are engaged in le learning are doing it, 93% of them are doing it via distance. So I hope that responds to your question out there in the audience. Thank you so much. Next question is for Daniel. This is Mary Ellen regarding about, budget, it, budget challenge. This is a question from Heather. Do you have to pay for budget challenge? And if so, how much? This is Daniel. Budget challenge is a paid plan per class, yes. 
and it is $25 per student. Sometimes um, if you want to connect to, you know, have the school pay for it, you can use a purchase order and work out the details and have it paid for that way. But yes, $25 and it's great. Dana, you said per student for two months, $25? That's right. Yes. And this is Todd. Is it worth it, Daniel? Yes, it is, Daniel says. This is Mary Ellen. Clearly from your message, I'm sure some adults would like to join and take the budget challenge program themselves. Todd says, I know I would join. <laughs> Me too, says Mary Ellen. Okay, we're moving on to the next question. Okay, so we mentioned the budget challenge. Another question from Erica has to do again with the budget challenge program. Uh, and the question is, how does it work? Do you develop the material themselves? Is it an Excel spreadsheet? Is it online? Is it a website? What exactly is the budget challenge? Budget challenge is a web-based program. It's all set up and developed for you. There's nothing for us to mm. develop. There's even different lesson pages um, where you can do expansions on certain topics. They also have quizzes and students can get awards for paying their payments on time or for various other reasons or making payments. So they get an award and a certificate of participation, which is great. They also do have an Excel spreadsheet where you can keep track, you know, like with checkbooks, you have a, your reconciliation uh, where you keep track of the checks that you've paid out. Excel, the Excel spreadsheet they have on there serves the same purpose. And so you don't That's have to nice. use any time developing any resources. You can just use your time explaining the program to so your nice. students. And they also have a teacher uh, portion as well. So you can go ahead and play around and get an idea of it. They have a logon for teachers to experience what their students will experience so that they can then explain it to their class. Yeah, you've got to understand it yourself first. Yeah. Yeah. It's called teacher play and a teacher play is absolutely free. So I recommend you start there. Look at that. And then uh, there's different time amounts of time uh, to sign up. And sometimes their list is full. So check it out. And this is Todd. We are running out of time. I have one more question that seems more of a general question. In your opinion, should personal finance be taught in high school only, or should it be taught earlier? Like for example, middle school or elementary school. When's a good time to teach about personal finance? Some families aren't sure as to when the right time to introduce that subject is. What's your take on it? This is Daniel. Some students have grown up in families where they've had access to language and they've learned concepts from an early age. They've gone with the parents grocery shopping and understood what was going on. So we have to take that same learning and uh, try to teach them that information that they would have learned throughout life had they had that language access. So it's our job to squeeze all of that information in and it's nice to have that- Condensed version, yeah. Yeah, the experiential exposure as well. I agree with you on that. A future topic uh, that will be covered in our webinars is exactly that question I asked you. How often and at what age do we expose our deaf youth to finance, personal finance? Well, we're out of questions for the evening. And Daniel, we want to express our gratitude for your joining us, sharing your tips and resources with us. We are very fortunate to have had you join us. And I'm sure the audience feels the same way I do. Right, Mary Ellen? Mary yeah, I'm Ellen. sure everyone in I'm sure everyone in the audience is trying to keep good notes of what they learned tonight. But again, folks, no worries. We will be sending out an email with that information. But Daniel, with what you said, I think folks here have something to think about instead of being overwhelmed. So uh, I know that teachers already feel overwhelmed at the moment anyway. So your information has just come at the perfect time and it was simple and easy to understand. Thank you for sharing it. Definitely. And of course, if anyone here has any questions, uh, find me on LinkedIn and send me any questions you uh, you would like, and I will be more than happy to answer them. This is Todd. Awesome, Daniel. Thank you so much. Uh, Daniel, if you don't mind, we're going to ask you to close out your video screen. We're going to wrap up the evening for tonight. And thank you again for joining us. This is Todd speaking. Wow. What an hour. Where did the hour go?
Uh, I mean, it's seven my time, eight o'clock your time, but. I think we could have easily gone for three hours. Really? Yeah. Why don't we? we let's stretch it out. <laughs> well, may maybe next time, but we do need to take some time now to wrap things up. Folks, we'd like to share that CSD Learns has toolkits that you can use within your classroom. You see one on the slide, dealing with debt and beginning your business. Other toolkits will also be releasing soon. Make sure you go ahead and take advantage of them. Also, Wells Fargo Foundation also offers their own program called Hands-On Banking. Please leverage that resource as well. And it is also usable in the classroom. And please take a look at it if you have not yet done so. Well, here's our last slide. That's all for tonight. Thank you for being here with us. Keep in mind, we will be sending an email with all the information and resources shared tonight. We will also include a survey. Please provide your feedback. Let us know what you liked and what we can improve so that our future webinars get better and better. The next one will be in the month of January. Folks, I hope you will attend as well. All right, have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye.